Top Med Talk. Nick McGerrison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This piece is taken from the Perioptive Medicine Shared Interest Group's 2018 annual conference, Measuring, Managing and Minimising Risk, which was held in association with the Australian and New Zealand Society of Geriatric Medicine and the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to check out the show notes on topmedtalk.com for more details. Have a listen. The first speaker is Don Campbell, who's Professor of Medicine at Monash University. Um, he works there as a general physician as well as at, regularly at Alice Springs Hospital. Um, he was president of the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand uh, about four or five years ago. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Charlie Cork. Charlie was uh, Director of Intensive Care at Geelong Hospital for many years, but has now backed off from his administrative position and has recently stepped down as President of the College of Intensive Care Medicine. But beyond his clinical contribution to intensive care, I think some of the fantastic work that Charlie's done has been working in the area of difficult communication scenarios in intensive care and has really driven the training program in intensive care around that and improving the quality of communication and teamwork amongst intensive care doctors. Okay, our our third speaker um, is uh, Karen Fielding, who's an orthopaedic surgeon from Wagga Wagga. That town's so good they named it twice. (laughs) Um, and you know the CanMeds diagram of, you know, what a doctor is supposed to be? Well, Karen's it. You know, she's skilled. She's an orthopaedic surgeon, does hips, knees, backs. Um, she's a great teacher, um, very popular with the med students and the um, trainees in Wagga. Um, she's a great collaborator, uh, manager, uh, leader. She's on the uh, Ants, um, RACS College Council. Um, and she's a great communicator, as you'll uh, see soon. I've got uh, a couple of questions, or three questions so far, so um, uh, keep them coming, but different topics. Uh, And (laughs) the team keeps on coming up. Uh, And I think, Don, you talked about, yeah, uh, coaching teams. Who are the coaches? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Like, like, I don't follow the round ball game. Uh, It's a silly game, but I know that there's someone in Britain called Alex Ferguson, and he's incredibly important, Um, and he's a coach of one of the teams. Um, Sorry? Well, whatever. Like I say, I don't follow the round ball game. But but it it struck me that probably 20 or 30 years ago, the coaches weren't people that people knew about. You knew about George Best. Uh, and the and the stars on the on the field, but now the community understands that the team is more likely to win if it has a great coach and manager, and they're becoming celebrities in their own right. But who are the coaches? Do we need coaches for the teams in hospitals? I think one of the important things uh, is to look at work is the task plus the conversation. It isn't just the techie bit, it's the talking to people. And if you're going to work in a team, it's about trust. Uh, How do we establish trust? Um, And leadership in an Australian context is, you know, I can do it, I'll show you how to do it. I'm not asking you to do anything I couldn't do myself. And then it's supporting you to do what we need to do. What's the role of the coach? We, we have a view of an organisation as a hierarchy of, uh, and that's borrowed from manufacturing industry from the 1910s. The way we actually get work done is in networks and communication and me doing my job properly so you can do your job perfectly. I think the coaching is around how to manage the conversations and we don't need the layers of administratum Uh, what we need is people that we trust who can help us get our jobs done so the next person can do their job perfectly. And the role of coaching and mentoring... I didn't Look, I couldn't even spell mentoring. I thought mentor was something that came in a packet that you got when you went to the pictures, but uh, apparently not. Um, So it's how do we get people functioning at their best as members of teams. You know, I'm a Melbourne Football Club supporter and we are crap, and, but we've been crap up until now and we hope to be better in the future. Other teams 
have a culture and it's how do you promote the culture and it's about the culture is that we will support each other so that we can all do our job well. It's building trust through communication. That's enough from me. Uh, you know, I think you have, to have, you have to choose the champion. So I don't think the coach will be the surgeon or the anaesthetist or anybody in any particular site. Um, and with all due respect to administrators, my husband was an administrator, so I have to be nice to them, but <laughs> they're probably not the right ones either. But um, <laughs> I think that you have to choose locally who's your coach. You know, you pick the person with the passion and the person with the passion, with the leadership and, and who can communicate to everybody will bring the teams together. Oh, that's what I think. And I'll just turn it around and say followership is also something that we're now thinking about a lot more and being a good follower involves um, expressing trust and taking, taking advice and being loyal. And if people can do that within the team, then it's very important. You need leaders and followers. If you've got no, either group, can mess it up terribly. So it's uh, it's about understanding all of those things to make it work. So how are we going to teach followers? Well, well it's you're, you're already It's being a good that. follower. So for me, it's not walking in and taking over. It's if someone's doing a good job, I will see what I can do to help them. No, I'm at a stage in my life where you know, walking in and taking over is quite the wrong thing to do and recognising that. It takes quite a long time for some people to recognise that. Yeah. Don, have you had experience with this at Monash? Yeah. Uh, I, please forgive me for the use of sporting metaphors and I will claim a quote from, I think it was Arthur Kersler, Everything in life I've learned about man, mankind, I have learned through sport. So if Kersler can say that, I reckon I, I could say that you know, sporting metaphors are about how we build teams. I've worked across a range of hospitals, uh, states, countries even, and uh, one of the tests I have for our junior staff, some of the people I've worked with when they were juniors are in the room, and my test is which is a, which is a unit where good people turn bad when they go in there? Uh, and you will all... I can see heads nodding. So we know, who, we know which those units are. The leadership is provided by the head of the unit. It's, you know, the, the fish rots from the head first. Uh, but equally, a good culture... And there's people here who worked in the Austin ICU. I worked with Jeff Guttridge once, and I said to Jeff, I made an appointment to see him. He said, what do you want to make an appointment for? And I said, I want to find out how you manage your team. I said, you've got guys with egos the size of houses... Uh, and they all work well together in a team. How do you do it? He said, oh, I just put it down to being slightly hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Karen, uh, talking about... You know, I know orthopaedic surgeons are often painted as a, in a stereotype, but is it too much to expect orthopaedic sur or any surgeon to be... Uh, good other than as a technician. I had a shoulder replacement myself 10 weeks ago, and if you had given me the choice of someone who was really good technician versus someone who you know, knew a bit of medicine and cared and you know, uh, you know, communicated well but you know, wasn't real good at actually putting the screws in the right place, I would have been torn. Actually, yeah, but the reality is, if you look at the evidence, that, you know, actually we're all pretty good surgeons. That, you know, the evidence is there that 97% or something of surgeons operate up here at this, you know, high technical level. And there are not very many of us that are outliers. Um, and the outlier problem is starting to be addressed. So I think once you, once you sort that out and, you, get, you know, you talk to those people who have terrible results on the joint registry and say, look, mate, you know, we're doing all that peer pressure stuff now... And, um, and, and, you know, the colleges and the societies have become a lot firmer on looking at outliers, and I think that is a big change that's coming very yeah. quickly. Um, then the reality is, I mean, you know, we can all stand on a pedestal, but surgery is not, not that difficult. Like, it's difficult, but <laughs> we all do it OK. So, so then, then we come down to what's going to say what's going to what, what are we gonna, how are we going to save money and how are we going to sustain our profession and we're not going to sustain our profession by operating on everyone who walks in the door and so 
unless the surgeon is purely the technician locked away in an ivory tower just doing that and you guys or somebody sends him the patient or her the patients, it won't work. We need to have clinicians. We need to be able to diagnose stuff. We need to be able to look at the patient and work out which patient will do well with an operation, which won't. And, um, and there's lots of models around the world. Toronto's got the hernia hospital and where the, tech, where the surgeons just do, you know, they just, they just operate and the hernias come through the door. Um, and, that, and that works quite well um, from a funding model if, if that's all they're doing. But, you, you know, you can't, we can't, it's not sustainable in Australia to have hernia surgeons, to have left toe surgeons, to have knee surgeons. We can't do that. It's not going to work. We have a major rural and regional problem. We have a huge workforce issue in those areas. We, we, we need to think back about generalists again. So if you're going to be a generalist surgeon, you actually need to know what you're doing. You need to be able to be a diagnostician and a clinician. So I, I think we have to rethink how we've been training. So, all right. Is the answer to your question. I think, I think yeah. there's a big shift in the super specialising coming back to generalism. We've been talking about that for a few years now at very high level, about, particularly for rural and regional. Um, it, it's not sustainable to have every single type of super specialist in those sites so, in our country. So you're saying that the technical challenge isn't the issue, but the communication and the teamwork Yeah, everything else is, is the issue, which is yeah. why the college has gotten on board with this new... I, I'm sure you've all heard about it. We were the first college to respond to all the um, bullying and harassment stuff, and we've made a huge inroad into that with um, courses and trying to train up our doctors and trying to you know, improve the role modelling of behaviour and hopefully you've all seen all the signs in theatre and all the stuff that we've done. It's been a very, very, very big program and it's now mandated you can't actually have tr trainees and we've already had to discredit some sites um, and trainees have been removed um, from some sites because of behavioural problems um, and that will continue for quite a while. So we've taken a very hard line on it um, at the college and, um, and we've got lots of professional skills coming in. So... I think one of the really big moves in surgery is that we've realised how important um, non-technical skills are. We've got courses in non-technical skills. It's something we talk about all the time. And we've, we've got our trainers doing it, our supervisors doing it. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't really open your mouth at the college anymore unless you've done half of these courses, So, which is good. And it's been difficult because, you know, surgeons are can be belligerent sometimes and they don't like to do things but I think everyone's realised that we need to move on and that we need to think about the non-technical stuff so teamwork and collaboration um, if you came to some of our meetings you would be amazed at how many times those words are said it's language communication language speaking differently talking about you know this new new nice language it's, <laughs> it's, it's touchy feely for orthopedics, eh? <laughs> it's, it, I, I just, it's interesting seeing the questions coming up, and they're almost anticipating the answers that you're, you're giving. Um, so maybe all three of you um, could talk about team building activities or how you've not in the rah rah. Well, maybe they are, but but um, and um, you know, the black hat. Um, having the difficult conversation in intensive care uh, or the, um, the processes and systems uh, that you were talking about, Don. Um, so what examples have you got of that or how should we do that well? Okay. Uh, I asked Norman Swan about this sort of stuff. Um, the, yes. the microphone. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think Australians really only understand one model of leadership Second lieutenant from the front, by example, day in, day, day out. How long's your track record? About 20 minutes. You're as good as your last case, you know. Uh, they don't give a toss about how good you think you are or how good you think you were. The older you get, the better you were. Um, no, one, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, and around the leadership of the team, I think... Uh, you know, what are the three features of uh, high-performing teams? We're in the room before the meeting starts. No one comes late to theatre. The boss is there first. So we're in the room before the meeting starts. We take it in turns to speak. We read the body language. That, that's, those are the three key features. Um, and the one I'd point to is the role of leadership 
in role of leadership and language in regenerating organisations. I can tell a quick story against myself. Um, in our hospital, Gen Med, we were the best at slagging off the ED. No one came close, right? We were the best, definitely. And uh, I read this thing that said, you know, if you want to change the culture of the organisation, the, the boss has to do, do the example. So I changed the way I spoke about ED and miraculously our unit stopped slagging off ED. And after six months I'd got sick of, got a bit frustrated, started slagging off ED. And uh, one of our physicians, whose name is Ralph Junkersdorf, Ralph stood up in morning report and said, look, we've started slagging off ED again, we'd stopped and I hate it, can we stop? And I said, Ralph, that's my fault. I give you a promise, I will not slag off ED again. So Ralph called us out. That's leadership. That's a behaviour enacted, embodied. Thanks. And I just endorse that. We have to remember that we're role model modelling things all the time. Everything we do is a role model to trainees and nurses. And what we do is watched and is seen and we do influence everything. So in order to make it work, we have to role model excellence. Otherwise, there's no hope of it happening. And we have to be brave. You know, we have to call this behaviour out and say, it's just not acceptable. So we had a particular person in our department. It's only small. It's eight surgeons in orthopaedics in Wagga. And one of them was, you know, effing this and essing this and everything in the meetings. In front of all our medical students, our trainees, absolutely appalling behaviour. Rude in, to, other, um, uh, to other colleagues as well as to the registrars. Completely unrealistic questioning. And it was just consistently happening every single Thursday morning x-ray meeting. And, you know, we all got sick of it. And I, I just felt terrible with my registrars. And a few people had said something quiet. And anyway, the, in the end, I took the person off. We, we've done this Vanderbilt stuff recently. And so we're all talking about how you call it out and how you go and speak to the person, take them for a cup of coffee. And so I took her for a cup of coffee. Well, that didn't work. So I took her for another cup of coffee. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> and there's this, there's this pyramid, you know. And she, I think she belongs up at the top. But anyway, <laughs> um, anyway um, I then took her for a wine. Well, that didn't work. So, um, so I said, right, it's such a small place, it's very difficult. So I put on the, uh, in the minutes of our orthopaedic department meeting, so we've got uh, welcome to country, we've got conflict of interest, and then item three, standing item, every single meeting from now on, we've got behaviour at meetings. And so I also took on the chair's role for a year, which really I didn't need because I've got a lot of other jobs, but I took it on for a year to try and get the behaviour sorted because our, our hospital had just signed an MOU with the college on this new Operating with Respect program, so I felt I had to do something. So I put it on, and, and now every meeting it's like, so any problem with any behaviour at meetings, guys, in the last couple of weeks? And they go, oh, no, oh, no. And the person now puts their hand up to say something. Yeah. Every single meeting puts their hand up doesn't say anything, doesn't yell, doesn't swear. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So you have to be brave and you have to have some strategies to do that. And, you know, all these models, Vanderbilt, whatever, will give you the strategies. But it's about just getting the courage and it's easier when you get older because you're just kind of like, ah, oh, what does it matter? I'm just going to stand up there and do it now. I'm old. So be brave. Be brave because, you know, I, I'm sure you're the good guys. <laughs> what, what about when the people aren't at the meeting anyway? Or, or if oh, it's, it's fine when they're not there. It's if, great. If you've got, if <laughs> they're you've not got at the meeting. Gen, Gen Med and ED have been slagging each other off for years and they're not getting on and it's not working. Or, or whatever, or someone who's well, in the department who doesn't come to meetings or whatever. What do you do then? Well, someone who doesn't come to meetings that is an issue, um, it's about excellence, it's about the, the teamwork and the where you're trying to get, and if they're not there, they're not contributing, and that is a problem, and you have to put it up as a problem. And I have, have a goal and, expect, and discuss with them why they're not there. As far as other departments behaving badly... Um, it's a, again about, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we have a mission that we are trying to achieve and you're not contributing to it and that's a worry for us and it's about always striving for excellence and not accepting less. And the more you do this, 
the more things become better and the less horrible it is working. So, you know, although it's a bit of an effort doing it, once it's done, things are much better for everybody. So it is a difficulty. And I mean, certainly as a college, you know, going to units that are very dysfunctional, you say, this is unacceptable. And the, the staff normally, you know, the director will normally say, yes, I know. And you say, you've got to do something about it. And they said, oh, really? You know, it's going on for so long, I can't bear it. It'll be awful. But in all of our occasions where we have been very tough as a college, um, and it has improved because we've been determined that it will, it's then been much better for everybody. The next accreditation, everyone is much happier. It, it really grinds people down, this awful behaviour. Yeah, it does. And sometimes, you know, you have to take it higher. So we, we had one who, we had two wrong side surgeries, we had a whole bunch of stuff that had happened that was really bad and not coming to meetings and, and not involved in M&M. And, mm. you know, in the end, it had to go to APRA and it had to have a review. And that's all horrible. It's absolutely horrible and you don't like doing it. But, you know, now he's everyone's best friend and he comes to all the meetings and he's doing peer review. And it's like he has, hadn't realised how bad it had gotten, like in that spiral. And sometimes that happens and, you know, they have family problems or maybe yeah. medical health problems and you don't kind of know what else is going on. And in retrospect, maybe the APRA thing wasn't the best way to go, but we didn't have a college process that was quite Probably. as good then. But those are all improving too. And sometimes people have to retire or leave. Correct. You know, it doesn't always become... It doesn't always resolve. It, then, some of these stories don't have happy endings. That's right. Hmm. All right. Well, one... <laughs> One more question. Um, how do we... This is from Sean McManus, who's a college counsellor, so I have to answer <laughs> ask this one. Um, but how do we empower GPs to be confident team players? You talked about it starts with the GP so, in, well, in the... Well, I, I think that you have to start right back... I'm, I'm a medical educator. That's really what I do. And mm. I think that the thing about medicine is we've got to, we've got to teach all the right behaviours and all the right things from the very beginning. So it's about the continuum. And, you know, our medical students are older and they're very engaged in their training now and a lot of them are post-grad and we need to be modelling good behaviours from the beginning. We shouldn't have bad teachers. We should, we, we, the people that are modelling that bad behaviour shouldn't be teaching our medical students. And we need to think about that in our units. And, um, and so we need to start right at the beginning and we need to start teaching them about you know, teamwork and, and multidisciplinary stuff. And I, I think that, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think when you start looking at, you know, a lot of the teachers are handpicked now. Um, some of the, it's certainly in rural, we have these small clinical schools and the teachers are all handpicked for this reason, um, to get people in with the right people and learning good behaviour. So I think you've got to start at the beginning and then you've got to keep reinforcing it all the way through. And we're going to discredit some jobs where, where things are terrible. Um, we're just going to have to take the hard line in the bad stuff, as you say. And, um, but we also need to keep it going through. In, med in surgery, we have a big problem with that pre-vocational space where they're disowned for four or five years while they're waiting to get onto a program. And, um, and that's really bad. It's really bad. So in New South Wales, we have a fantastic program um, uh, by Hedy Health Education Training Institute, which looks after all those doctors in the middle, and they're loved again by somebody because when they're not loved, they learn all the bad stuff, um, and that's something that hasn't happened in all the states in Australia. And I just happen to chair that as well for Hedy, and so we look after the junior doctors, and they've all got little networks, and and we do all sorts of nice skills things, and um, so I think that's the other thing. We've got to look after the doctors in that space. And we need to, again, it's about finding the champions, finding the people that love doing that. And if you love doing it, you do it well. Right? <laughs> well, we, we, we have had lots of discussion about defining the processes and defining or, you know, focusing on the process itself. But ultimately, there are people involved and improving the performance of those people and Loving them, even, yeah, yeah exactly. as part of the solution. Uh, Don and Charlie, any uh, final comments? Uh, just one. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that, who's wrote this line, but basically, um, we live in language. A fish lives in water. You know, there's a... I wish I could remember the name of the author, but it's a story of an old fish swimming down a river and two young fish swimming the other way. And uh, as they passed, the old fish said to the younger fish, "'Morning, boys, how's the water?' And as he passed, the one fish, one of the younger ones turned to the other and said, what does he mean by water? Uh, so f 
we live in language the way a fish lives in water and uh, we create uh, what the world is like by the way we speak and the language we use. Uh, so how we play into this space with um, our relationships with our GPs uh, and how to get them on board. We, got, we went out and asked our GPs what they want of us as a hospital. They want to be able to pick up the phone and make one call and find a friend. Yeah. They want to be able, if they want to deal with a urological problem, they want to talk to a urologist, orthopaedics, and so it goes. They, when Elvis leaves the hospital, they want the discharge summary on their desk there and then, and they want to know that if they send a referral for an outpatient appointment, A, we received it, B, what date and time the appointment's been made. We went out to general practices and we got a welcome to country you wouldn't believe. Uh, now my ears are still ringing and I knew the people and the language was pretty choice. Uh, but some of those general practices, one general practice in our district has two full-time employees whose only job is scanning faxes they get from us. Really? Yeah. Now, that's just insane. So we've got to work on how and yet how do we create a, yeah. create a conversation space that matters to them, that helps them get their job done. Everyone wants to be a better, faster doctor. Everyone listens to WIFM. What's in it for me? Uh, so how do we work together? Thank you. Okay. Charlie. Well, in another life, I do one weekend in a very rural hospital in an emergency department, um, and that's been a revelation for me because I ring up registrars and uh, discuss patients with them, and I get two sorts of response. I'm commonly ringing just to say, do you want me to send the patient or can I manage them? That's what I'm asking. And I get two sorts of registrar. There's the registrar who just continually says to me, if you can't cope with it, you can send it, which was not my question. <laughs> And I hate it, and it's really awful. So it's about no respect. It's about they're not reading what I'm saying, they're not listening to what I'm saying, and they're demeaning me and undermining me, as opposed to others who say, well, you know, who answer my question and say, if you're happy, this is the parameters I do, and if it gets outside that, I'll be very happy to take the patient. The two responses are so different, and um, you know, I just I'm conscious that there are repeated small insults to GPs all the time, and the fact that they feel unhappy, I think, is not a big surprise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I think that's been a really fascinating session. That, as we said, for the title of this session, perioperative medicine is a team game, and I think this is what we need. Learning from the real key players of the team and the people who have been masters at it um, to teach us all how to do it and coach us all better. So please, thank you. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, TopMed Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on TopMed Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.